This is Off Planet Radio. Hey everybody, welcome to Off Planet Radio. It is the new year 2018. And uh, we're heading for the stratosphere or whatever it is that sits up there above uh, 50,000 feet this year. We're redefining, we're redefining um, a lot of the ontological aspects of our existence, live on air a lot of times. And that's what this series really is about. It's about looking at things critically and creatively and understanding who we are and how we mesh with the perception of realities that... Uh, well, they don't exactly stack up to what we were taught in ninth grade science class, and um, that's the way it goes. Emily Moyer's with me. Hey, Em. Hey, how are you? Nice hey, to doing, be back. Doing, yeah. doing, doing good. Awesome. And uh, we're going to hit it with Cliff High. This is time part three. And of course, I don't really need to do an introduction with Cliff. Um, the website is um, halfpasthuman.com. You can see it in the background. Cliff, hi, welcome back, back again to Off Planet Radio. Thank you very much. Glad we're here for number three and we can yes. um, put it to bed seriously, I think. All right. And bring up all of the really interesting bits. Yes, yes. Hi, woo woo. Exactly, exactly. <laughs> <laughs> I like I to think to... of it as deep. <laughs> deep, okay. deep, okay. <laughs> okay. This is going to be. Woo, 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 woo tonight, right? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. yeah. Right. And just before we get started, I just want to let people know that we decided, um, because this series on time was started before we just moved to a split show format, that all of the uh, information on time this evening will be in the publicly available section of the show, and then there'll be a, a patrons-only section at the end uh, covering a few other topics and whatnot. So just letting everybody know that's what we're doing here on this show before we get started. And with that said, Cliff High, what time is it? <laughs> now that's a really good question. So let's let's start off with sort of a mystery. All right. Consider that um, we'll we'll state some postulates. We'll assume that they're true for our thinking purposes, and we'll perform a little thought experiment and totally scramble our brains. <laughs> all right. So so nice. the, post, the the postulates are, and and I'm not disagreeing that I'm not saying that they're not true, and but I just want to state them and make everybody say uh, assume that we're we're thinking about them as true, so that we can get beyond the truth component of this, right? But let's state as a postulate that uh, the Farsight Fellows, you know, the Farsight Institute, Courtney, 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 yeah. exactly, yeah. okay, and his remote viewers are indeed performing a, a um, as they think they are a remote viewing in far distant time when they set up an experiment to that effect, okay? okay. And, and so we're, we're postulating that remote viewing works and that it'll work outside of our current time frame, and that they were accurate in how they approached it in their latest um, thing about war in space, okay? Deep war in space, right? They did this uh, a remote viewing of these uh, circumstances and came to the conclusion that there was this giant war in space between giants uh, humanoids and giant reptilian guts. And uh, so we'll postulate that all this is true just for the thinking of this about time because there was a very unique, very interesting component of this that surfaced that caught their attention. They commented on it, but at the same time, um, they didn't uh, didn't stop and examine the uh, the whole context of what that actually was saying about what was going on. It's spooky enough just on the surface of it, and then they had to get on with their work, so I'm not faulting them at all. They didn't have the time to go into it. But here's the setup for this, and I don't know which one of the remote viewers it was. I'm sorry about that. It was one of these two women, yeah. and she was, she was re remote viewing this uh, spot, all she's given is a coordinate. It turns out that later on they find out it maps to distant war in, in space, right? And so she sees all of the parameters. They've got all kinds of validation for all of uh, both of the work. All the remote viewers see the same thing, even though they're separated. And so it's like a regular neat experiment. And what she sees is she sees these uh, uh, three, three beings. Uh, one of them is a, is a big lizard guy, and the other two are big hominids like ourselves, only giant buggers, I mean, really tall. 
maybe 36, 50 feet, who knows? And she's, she's uh, remote viewing these, these uh, uh, I guess you'd have to say civilizations in conflict. During the process of the remote viewing though, a very interesting thing occurs in which she stops, she's getting into the details, describing it all, and all of a sudden she stops and says, am I being probed? Because uh -huh. she, as a remote viewer, sensed an, another consciousness that was saying to, was probing on her, right? And so in her um, interaction with that other consciousness, we, in, in the uh, remote viewing episode, we come to understand that she's uh, responding to the consciousness of one of the beings that was being involved, that she was scanning. So basically, it's her own fault. She started it. <laughs> okay. <laughs> but the, the interesting part about this is, what does that say about time uh -huh. and the nature of time? Okay. Because those beings are, are dead. They were dead millions of years ago, presumably. I'm not sure. I didn't watch the whole thing. I'm not sure where their time focus was. So let me get this straight. They claim they, I haven't seen this. Uh, I, they, I saw the clip where they were talking a little about it. I haven't watched the full clip, so I know. So what they were remote viewing about. the past or the future? The past. The past. Okay, so this is the cosmic wars. Correct. Okay. In which, in which the fifth planet in our solar system was okay. blown, what, turned into an asteroid belt. Okay. And Mars is scraped loose by, you know, scraped over by nukes, and there's energy weapons, and boy, and actually to hear them describe the battle, it's, uh, you know, it was a real uh, humdinger, real, uh, no one's going to be turning their head away while this stuff's going on. Anyway, and so she's um, examining the participants, these humanoids and this lizard being, and uh, feels the sensation in her um, a remote viewing sensation process of being probed by another consciousness. Now, this brings up several different questions. Okay, now she goes further, continues to do some sensing, and uh, the other consciousness, which was one of these beings she was scanning in her remote viewing, just breaks it off and walks away in a rather rude fashion. Didn't even say goodbye, right? Just hikes off. But basically also cut off and sealed that aspect of the remote viewing from that point on. Now, so this is a very interesting sort of uh, conundrum. Uh, the conundrum component of it comes in as a statement about time. Totally. Be <laughs> uh, because, because what was going on that a dead being over a million years dead, or however long, it could be two years, it wouldn't make any difference. Dead is dead. But this being of some ancient past, consciousness was uh, examining her in our present. Was she examining it in its present okay and this gets us back to the ever present now yeah i was gonna say it's <laughs> entirely possible that the two two presents are concurrent that, Correct. That, right that that we are not dealing with the situation so much of past present and future but in uh um concurrent nows uh, Correct. In, in multiple, exactly. now, multiple nows and are the um different not only is it and this is with my next question. Not only is it her being from our now and them being from their now uh, entangled with each other, but is there also the possibility of being entangled with other iterations or incarnations of yourself? So she of herself and then of themselves. Yes. In, the, in, that, <laughs> okay. in that scenario, yeah. right. Basically, right. you went where I was thinking, the, other, the aspect of other expressions of our beingness are stacked multiple reality streams. Okay, and, and we're, I'm not quite going that far with okay. this. I understand the concept, and stacking is very Back accurate. me off the cliff, then. Okay. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's <laughs> yeah, too just, high. It's too high. <laughs> just, just a little bit too far too, far too soon, okay? All right. But, but the idea comes in as going back to the, um, uh, the little bloop theory and the constant pulse that's always through time, and it becomes more complex over time as it is, we become more complex. Universe continues to grow because there's bazillions of little bloops popping in continuously, and they're becoming more complex. Every time they come in, they bring in space and time around them, and the space merges with the local time, or with the local space, 
and the time component they bring in adds to the ever-present now. <clears throat> okay, now there's another aspect of this that's actually validated, and we know it and we can prove it. It's been part of our uh, teaching on all of this, uh, on all of our physics and everything, uh, as long as we've been alive, and that is that things spin. Atoms spin, right? We see it in, in nature. Tornadoes spin, cyclones spin, hurricanes spin, water spins, planets spins, all of these things spin, well, spin, our spin. Our own energy field spins. Our correct, own correct. Field spins. Yeah, basically yeah. toroidal fields. Correct. Okay, now, and we have to, and we think about it this way. Let's go, remember to come back to the word entanglement, though, also. Let's not okay. lose sight of that, because you were very prescient in bringing that aspect up. Okay, so our toroidal, we're actually uh, like two funnels at the, yes. joined at the, at the narrow ends, all right? We spin as well, continuously, constantly, and we spin in a multiple of directions. Uh, and also our little individual parts are continually spinning. And in fact, our brains are designed to compensate for that. And we have components of our brains that when they go wonky and can't compensate anymore, what happens to us? Oh, my head feels like it's spinning. Right, so we yeah, have... Yeah. Yeah, yeah, see, so the spinning slips through into our consciousness when you get drunk or you take certain types of drugs or you get hit in the head in a specific way or develop um, a vertigo from, you know, right, water yeah. in the ears and all yeah. this kind of thing, right? And, and then we actually become aware of the spin. And we're not actually in any way at that point spinning any faster, moving in any different way than we've ever moved, but the impact on our consciousness is as though we're in this continual spin state. And is it really us that is spinning at that stage, or are we just reacting to the fact that the universe is spinning the other way than we are? And, and so we, we start seeing at that level. But the point is, is the spin component of it. As each one of these little atoms or new points of energy is created in universe and comes in, it comes in already spinning. That is our, and this, this feeds right into free energy, so we can bring that up later, but the, um, the spin that comes in from these uh, atoms as they're created and all existing atoms is in fact the materium as close as we can get to the pulse. So as close as we can get to the 22 trillion times a second pulse is the spin rate of the electrons around the, the nucleus and the spinning of the whole atom and it's spinning within the molecule and then all the molecules spinning together. And these, the spin, is our um, closest sens sensory uh, or, or sensor availability to that pulse, but that's also our closest touch that we can get to time. Okay. This, okay. okay. So this is the pulse, the 22 billion. Tr tr trillion. Trillion. 22 trillion. Trillion. Okay. So I, just because we're spinning around this 22 trillion, I've had, so we have a lot of friends who I would consider to be part of sort of a very high information crowd. There's been a lot of conversation about these talks on time going on and them correlating it to other information coming out and things people are wanting to know. And, okay, I'm gonna see if I can ask this question, right? Use the correct terminology because I'm not a computer person. But the question has come up is with this whole theory of, the, of reality or the coming in and out of existence 22 trillion times a second. Is there some kind of funny connection between this focus that has happened uh, and, you know, Catherine Austin Fitz has brought it up a number of times about the $21 trillion, the missing $21 trillion, and we hear the number $21 trillion a lot right now. Is there some attempt to almost slow us down so that this, this, this touch with time that you're talking about can be manipulated? Is a focus on another, like, does this, does you, is, people have brought I'm this up? I'm getting the sense, yeah. Okay, you, you, okay. And he, almost as if there's something within us that like, almost like a time crystal that can be clock, like a clock, the clock speed can be manipulated. And this yeah. focus on 21 million Bitcoins, 21 trillion, whatever is trying to somehow distort this 22 trillion it, pulsing in and out of reality that you're talking about. But particularly where it relates to 21 trillion missing mi dollars of missing money. Right. Right. Is there any, I mean, cause you have, there is always um, in some funny way, even though I know in a lot of ways you guys have some disagreements on things that are going on. There is 
a huge entanglement between a lot of the things you say and a lot of the things Catherine Austin Fitz says and, and whatever. Like, there's a lot of discussion about that too. It's obvious you guys had disagreements, but much mutual respect. And I think it's fascinating. So one of our list, one of our good friends, Jeff Gates, has this idea, and also Danny McKinney and her husband brought this up. This 22 trillion, this 21 trillion, and this idea that we have somewhere within us. And if, if I were if I were the person saying so, I'd say it has something to do with the sugar we consume being programmable matter and crystalline, right. acting as a time crystal that is the control of our sort of clock rate. And, Correct, and okay. it does through it does so through the pancreas, which yeah. is where our consciousness is. Yes. They've been trying it since um, uh, the medieval times, and okay. we see the first evidence of it with the introduction of both tea and sugar oh, okay. into, into uh, Britain and France sure. as the fuel for the Industrial Revolution. Tell me, so, yeah. so, so Correct. my concept, I don't know if you see any of my video series on sugar as programmable matter. So there is validity to what I'm saying about this idea of sugar as programmable matter and it being part of what has kept us sort of programmed and trapped to the system. I don't know that I would use the word programmable because I'm a programmer. Okay? okay. So I have a very, very tight definition of that. Okay. But alter, alterable, mutable, okay. an effective agent, any number of okay. other terms I would okay. indeed apply. So, okay. so the concept correct, but maybe the word I'm using, not, not. It doesn't, you know, the word, I because you. I'm a, a coder, you. right? You know, yeah. so, yeah. so. It, uh, it, it's the, it's the agent to make us alterable. Correct. Okay. And here's, and here's, okay. And so the next layer they're doing though, I mean, follow it through history. Okay. And, and you see that as we progress through history, we go uh, from a, a society in which almost all humans only worked three hours a day to provide the bare sustenance that was required for the family. Right. Okay. And the other time you, you were human. You yeah. didn't waste, waste screwing around. Now we, we got to the point where we went through the Industrial Revolution in Britain, in France, people were complaining about it. It was synced up to the revolutionary cycles. It gets over to uh, America. And in an America, we make the jump from tea to coffee, all right? Mm -hmm. Much more effective, deliverable yep. uh, caffeinated substance, right? And people put much more sugar in coffee than they do in tea. Correct, in order because of the bitterness. So, right? but, and, but, so but, and you Not put the me, baby. Together. I take it straight. <laughs> <But> you, you <laughs> and put, same here. Now, I, I allow together. myself. You put, I, you put coffee and, and sugar together, and you basically mm. almost have methamphetamine. Well, it's Coca Cola. Correct. Well, My you have something very close to, to cocaine. Yeah. Yeah. Look, who the, exactly. look who the hero of the, of the early 1900s was um, uh, Shlomo, uh, Shlomo Sig Sigismund uh, Freud. Right. Okay. Yeah. And Freud, Freud, he was a cocaine addict mm -hmm. and he took um, morphine to come down and sleep at night. Yeah. <laughs> you know, well, and, and he was, he was on people, nicotine really, really heavily. Right. And most people who do methamphetamine or cocaine take Xanax or Valium or whatever to sleep at night. And right. they also smoke the whole day along with that. And, and nicotine is its own interesting properties and character. Okay. That Very similar to this. caffeine. Right. Yeah. The benefit to tea is this: tea has theine in it, okay? Mm -hmm. And the and the um, uh, the ancient the monks in Nepal that really started drinking camellia sinensis leaves soaked in in hot water, which is tea. Uh, they were the they would be scandalized at the way we use it. They used it as a uh, uh, a specific drug for like remote viewing, uh, exactly. heavy duty meditation, yeah. all of yeah. this kind of stuff, right? Okay, so now here's some interesting things. Uh, just what we need to know in our database. Um, Let's talk about the vagus nerve, vega nerve system. Okay? Yeah. All right. So there's, so we think of our spines as being a spinal cord with all these nerves running it through it. And indeed we have that. And if you rupture your spine, you get into problems. All right. But those are not really your main uh, conscious control system nerves at all. Uh, okay. They're your, they're the uh, nerves that make all of the, the extremities they're your, work. They're your motor skills. Your motor Correct. Function. Correct. Yeah. But, but the everything vagus, else, vagus nerve. Right. Vagus. Everything else is controlled by the vagus nerve. And it's really interesting because it goes as part, it, it is, uh, the vagus nerve basically is our uh, autotomic nervous system. Well, isn't it, that also the part of the body that's, when people speak of things like certain kinds of electronic harassment or targeted individual kind of stuff, it's often the vagus nerve that is what's being attacked with these correct. kinds of weaponry. Correct. And, yeah. and the reason is it's not surrounded by bone. Okay. Yeah. If you were to strip off all of the flesh, leaving only the bones and the nerves, you would see this thing that almost resembles an alien that uh, connects from the, from the back of the brain, through the glands in the throat, through what we think of as all of the, the chakras, mm -hmm. the, the respiratory system, the heart, uh, your liver, 
uh, your, your lungs, of course, your spleen, uh, your pancreas, your gallbladder, your intestines are all interconnected with this vagus nerve. And in fact, the bacteria in your gut produce serotonin that goes into the vagus nerve that goes up to your brain. 80% of the serotonin that makes you depressed, or, you know, makes you feel happy and not depressed right. comes from your stomach area. And it transit in a nervous system that is really unique, really cool stuff. The vagus nerve goes on up and it meets all of these organs and goes into the brain, except for one major organ system, and that is the adrenals, all mm -hmm. right? It does not touch the adrenals. Now, here's, here's why coffee is so, so deadly under that uh, condition because coffee affects the adrenals. It flattens the adrenal cortex, the adrenal, um, the, the part of the adrenal glands that is actually in charge of doing the secretions. And so the caffeine dose and the other chemicals within the bitter coffee and the bitter taste itself excite a particular kind of a response. Uh, and I can't think of the name of it now, but it's called the break. Oh, it's, uh, it's the uh, it's sub- Broncus, uh, Broncus uh, I know what you're saying, Broncus area. Right, exactly. Yeah. Okay, and it causes and and so uh, and so going over to coffee is the fuel for our industrial revolution. Uh, unlike the Brits and unlike the French, who were big tea drinkers at the time, um, we were in a situation where we started suffering damage within our adrenals. All right, now the adrenals are close to uh, they they are thought to be like a reserve, produce a, a adrenaline in case you, you know, the fight flight response, the reptilian brain and all of this. Mm -hmm. However, they're intimately tied into uh, the liver and the pancreas and the pancreas is the seat of consciousness. And so yeah. you get into some weird effects there, right? Now, uh, the reason to bring it up, the reason to think about OKT and fueling the industrial revolution and where we are now goes directly to your point of the malleability of our relationship to time. Because back when we were peasants in the 1600s, before the revolution, industrial revolution, time was basically, oh yeah, yeah, they're, look, they're putting up that strange machine at the top of, a, of the church, and, and it's going to tell the time. But I don't care. None of those digits mean anything to me. I have no relationship to them. I don't have to care about them. I, I milk the, the goat when I need to, you know, get the sheep out of the field when I feel like it at the end of the day. I don't care what that number says. However, time relative in that sense, as a as a, a mechanism, is necessary for the control structure. Yeah, and we all recognize that now. If time went away in a in a consistent fashion, the control structure falls apart within the time it takes it to realize it's got no more time. I mean, it, happen <laughs> it happens that rapidly. Right? So qu quickly, before I lose this train when we're on this. So I think I ha my brain does funny stuff with this stuff. But, you know, I spent a lot of time thinking about and focusing on health. And a lot of my uh, changes and came when I eliminated sugar from my diet, which I had been addicted mm -hmm. to for many years. And uh, so I, you know, o over time developed this idea that part of what keeps us programmed or altered or controlled is sugar. And especially what we're going further and further into this like frequency soup. And now with 5G coming on exactly. the and the amount of sugar, there's su there is so much sugar in everything. Things that never used to have sugar in them before have sugar in them, right? Is, is it turning, is it basically sugar has some of the same qualities as like a computer chip. It's crystalline, it's cubic, it can hold information, all of that kind of stuff. When you have a bunch of it in your blood, okay? And then you're, there's these 5G frequencies and is it almost making, turning our bodies into part of the internet of things? That is that easily able to be clocked, measured, controlled, altered, all of that kind of stuff? I almost wonder if the call, you know, we all know that they have, they love sort of double entendres and mm -hmm. calling things from, is, is the 5G also code for if you have more than five available grams of sugar in your blood at a time, does that make you controllable by saying <laughs> You know, like okay. And see, that kind of level of symbolism is, is really possible. They, yeah. they do shit like that. Okay, no question. Yep. Um, okay, so you're sort of correct. I hate the idea of, of thinking about it as a programmable thing because um, it, it, that would imply the idea that we could in some way impart information to an individual sugar crystal and have it go do something, okay? Right. However, however the idea that it, it is a substance that is used to alter your natural relationship with time, 100% yes. agree, 100%. Right. 
And it's gotten to the point now where I was just going to bring up, initially you were a peasant, you were herding your sheep, and they put up this new machine in the, <laughs> in the top of the church. And, and there you go, right? You know, you've got a clock in your village. Initially, and, we, were, we were herding the sheep. That was before we became the sheep. The right? sheep, correct. Well, <laughs> how interesting correct. that they put an obelisk on top of a religious yes. institution with, in a, sun, with a dial. Yeah. Uh, you yeah. know, that's not right. lost on me that we're yeah. going right back to Horus and the whole Egyptian on, ontological thing as well. Well, they know, see, they know at that level that time is the control mechanism. It's a gate. Right? It, correct. And it is, a, it is the gate to yes. our experience as humans. It controls our, our experience of humans. And you can control humans through their experience of time. And look at us, all of us now, I don't know where mine is because I'm rather casual about it, but you've got your little cell phone. And, and that cell phone, guess what it is? It's the chip it's in your clock. hand. Yeah. Yep. Exactly. It's a clock. And not only is it's it a, not only is it a clock. Yeah. Yeah. That's and good. not only is it a clock, but as a clock, it's tied to atomic time. Yeah. You don't yeah. ever yeah. have to set this thing. You don't Never. wind it. Right. You're not in charge of it. You couldn't change it, most of us, if we tried, right? I th it also, I think that these devices are part of what's being used for, shall we say, time, do time control, time domain, uh, time domain extension, right? Like, do you remember those Sprint commercials a few years ago where the guy was, was for like what, the, uh, one of the new iPhones, I think, where he was basically talking about time traveling, like tra time traveling forward to Sunday to get leftovers to eat for dinner tonight. <laughs> kind of thing, and to me, that was an acknowledgement that yeah. that the, uh, that they were. This is the, uh, some more coded information of them basically saying, "Hey, look, we're able to control time by you having these little devices." Well, it's part <coughs> of the entrainment well, that we've gone through. We're able to basically through. create yeah. a, a simulated time travel experience, not a real one, because we've talked about your feelings yeah. about that, right? But a simulated thing where it's actually time control. If we say it's this time, then you think it is, whether it actually is that time or not, doesn't matter. So we Correct. can sort of move things around. I mean, we I don't know if you've had the experience, but certainly Randy and I both have of like, you wake up in the middle of the night, the clock says 324, and then you wake up what seems like two hours later and it says 230. Yeah, yeah. Right, yeah. yeah. And yeah. It, it's, it's, you know, and you have to wonder what's going on here. <laughs> well, okay, so uh, without going into that, because it's part of the idea, but you know, our experience as consciousness of time is malleable, right? Because it yeah. is all coming through our senses and it is all ultimately ending up uh, from the subsystem of our senses in our consciousness. And so time independent of our consciousness could be argued does not exist. Could also be, if oh. from, that, from that premise, if we assume that that premise was correct, then we can also say, oh yeah, it makes a lot of sense if you're at the top of the power pyramid to get the rest of the society underneath you all synced up on time yep. that you basically control and that yep. you decide when things happen, you know. It's and, uh, predictable, it's controllable. It and makes, it, it's like training sled dogs. It, it's something easy to get people to, con to agree upon, to create consensus about. So you don't even have to work too hard to control the, on all these other aspects of control because you already have everybody synced up. So you just have to basically deploy well, that was the basis one of kind of program. And yeah, that was okay. the basis of Pavlov and Delgado's experiments with the, uh, with the animals was right, the stimulus and in response. Okay, now let's stick with stimulus and response, the idea of entanglement, and go back to the idea of the consumption of these particular kinds of drugs right. that, go, that affect our adrenals and bring in the, the idea that we need a lot of sugar floating around in our system, right? Because when they affect our adrenals, the adrenals and their relationship to the uh, pancreas uh, form, if you will, a checksum on time for Ooh. our bodies. Yeah. Okay. And you can eliminate that checksum because that checksum is the, uh, uh, people may not understand that, but a checksum is, uh, I'm going to give you a column of figures and I'm going to give you another number. And this number that I'm going to give you should be included in the, in the sum of that column of figures so you know you've added it up correctly. If it doesn't add up to produce this number, the way you did it is wrong and your process is bluey and we know something's gone wrong. Like in third grade when you had to show how you check, you have to, you had to show how you did your work. So well, this is how you validate certain yeah. software packages when you download them. You Correct. Have, you have a checksum. Right. If it doesn't have this many bytes well, okay. and this arrangement, right. It's maybe, the integrity. Maybe, that, maybe that's a better definition of what I'm trying to say. Does that level of sugar in our blood and all this frequency soup make us sort of easy to download it's software a control, packages. It's a control yeah. element. Okay. It's a control element. Now, and yeah. it's also a somewhat insidious one that a lot of people don't really think about, okay? How many times a day do you check the time? Do you casually see the time? 
in the displays that these phones insist on providing yeah. you. And it used to be before we had the ubiquitous cell phone, we had public time everywhere, especially yeah. on banks, banks, police stations, government agencies, car dealerships, all that. Yeah. You got all of that. Anybody that was involved at that level of control was trying to keep everybody in sync. And they could, you can make a prima facie argument that, oh, well, it, it works for meetings. If we didn't have time to coordinate, the three of us would not be talking here at this point. And that's, that is true. Back when we were peasants herding our sheep, whether we connected, you know, you'd say, well, I'll meet you, you know, at dusk. And so there might be a half hour difference in our interpretation of dusk, but it didn't matter because we didn't have any other pressing engagements, so to speak. So you'd hang around. So it all worked out both ways. Now, though, we've got this other system going. Now, um, so that we know we're familiar with the idea of neuro-linguistic programming. Yes. And we're familiar with the idea of hypnosis, okay? And so if I can get you to repeat a, and we're familiar with the idea of um, the law of attraction and uh, all of that stuff out of the movie, The Secret and that kind right. of thing. And basically you program your mind to try and acquire those things that you want to have. And you do this by repetition, fundamentally. And so here we have the situation where we've all got a little device that ties us to atomic time on an atomic uh, uh, cesium clock controlled network. And we're programming our minds with this continuously throughout the day as we casually grant, glance at it. We're actually entering into a long-term hypnotic state in relation to our uh, ability to deal with these devices. And it gets even more insidious. Software programmers are using algorithms that produce responses in our brains to flood our brains with dopamine. And that's why you stay on social media long after that's you right. should, that's right. should have that's left. That's why those right? little dings right. and those little, it's almost again goes back to Pavlov and Delgado. Yeah. When you do, when you get a hit on Facebook, and I, I know this because I've watched my I've watched my phone go batshit crazy when I post something because a lot of times I post things that have responses loaded into the linguistics of what I'm posting. So I'm getting this and my wife will hear my phone and it'll be going bing, bing, bing. And she'll go, what did you just post? And see, that's, that's, that's neuro-linguistic programming. It's the stimulus and response. It's, it's a form of hypnosis. It's biofeedback. Yeah. It's all right. of those things. Yeah. Right. yeah. And it's going on continuously. Yes. And it's involving bright lights at specific frequencies with algorithms designed to do things to those lights to cause specific things to yep. occur in your eyes such yep. that your brain's being altered, which goes back to Emily's point about altering our relationship to time. Not only the ownership of it, but our, our personal relationship. How many people actually feel continually pressed by time? Mm. And, you know, yeah. they sit there and that's the component, that's the caffeine, that's the sugar, that's the impact on the adrenals, the flooding of the adrenal cortex uh, with these other hormone dampening agents that cause it not to kick in when it should to get you to get away from the machine, get away from the stress and so on. It allows you to handle more longer, but at a degradation to your body and to your mental state, yeah. all of which goes to an attempt <clears throat> to try and influence your consciousness because that's ultimately what they want to do. They want to harvest you in Catherine Austin Fitz's terms about um, yeah. selling stuff to you and so on. But I think it's actually a little bit more insidious than, than that. Okay. A little bit deeper, a little bit uh, murkier woo. We're fishing down at the bottom of the rabbit hole. There's water yeah. in there. We can't really see what's going on. And so you have to ask yourself if, if at a, at a very key level, Emily is not correct about the idea that this is a soup or a cocktail, and it was specifically designed for a specific kind of a response from the recipe that they're creating. Yep. And it doesn't work all the time. See, here's the thing. <clears throat> we're, we're hormetic creatures, right? Um, every day if I come and I take a little bit of uh, ibogaine poison, and every day, uh, or yeah, I can start off and do it once a week, and then every day I take just a little tiny bit, a couple of years, maybe two months, five months, a year from now, my liver will know how to deal with that compound such that I cannot be poisoned by a fatal dose of it. But if, and I can sit there and happily take a whole shot glass full of the stuff. Now we know what's going on, Cliff. <laughs> well, sort of, sort of, but you know what I'm saying. You know what I'm saying, right? Yeah. And, and so, and so we are hormetic creatures that way. Little tiny bits of toxins mm -hmm. can be used to build up our system such that we have a response that makes that no longer a toxin to our system. What does not kill you makes you stronger. You know, uh, there, as long as your body has the ability to recover, 
you can you can overcome and, and so, adapt to it. So are you saying the same thing about sugar? And that's why they're constantly having to come up with more insidious forms. They have to come up with high fructose corn syrup. They have to come up with GMO beets to make the sugar from because they, they have to find like, our bodies and and, and we adapt. We and harden. Then we overcome. In this conversation, what on earth and really is kombucha? <laughs> which is awful. Yeah, which is the, yeah, the which is the really, combustor for the system. It's, it's really sucks. bad. Right. But what, then then. Like, forget about the typical explanations we had. Let's really ask the question: What on earth really is diabetes? That's a really good question because we right. know it's not disease. Right. We know are it's these, condition. Are, are 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 these like you know? Is it so? Right. So these um, something about whatever's happening to the body, maybe with this combination of. Of, because the, if you look at the rise in diabetes, it rose when the frequency soup started, when there started right. to be more high fructose corn syrup. All of these things seem to come in combination. So are these people's bodies rejecting the program, the alteration, the programming, the poisoning in a way that's making them sick? And for some reason, our bodies are able to deal with it, but actually their bodies are giving what should be all of us a warning that there, right. there's exactly. something funny going on. Right. There, there and you can even extend level. it. Okay, now we know that they use layers within layers within layers. The lie is different at each layer, yes. and there's a different goal and agenda at each layer yes. in every different direction you look. Mm -hmm. And so we needn't go into it too much longer, but let's look at the idea of what they're doing to the masses of the adrenal glands for everybody, right? Mm -hmm. Because soda pop is as damaging as is uh, coffee, all right. right? Perhaps more so. And so uh, is because, <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's rough being alive, but okay. Yeah. Uh, so, but, but what they're doing is they're maintaining our adrenal glands. Now, the, the adrenal glands, as we point out, are not connected to the vagus nerve, all right? So if you get your liver, or your pancreas out of whack, you can do things. You can actually make your liver regrow and no longer be diseased. Uh, you can do this to any number of parts of your body. The vagus nerve is really interesting because from, from a meditation point, that's where you get into the control of your body such that you can control your consciousness. And you usually get at it through breath, but the vagus nerve is actually connected to all of our senses as well. So one way of doing it is to separate the two halves of the system into parasympathetic and sympathetic. And the sympathetic keeps beating whether we're awake or asleep or whatever, and the parasympathetic uh, allows, it can take over that. So you can consciously decide to, breathe, mm -hmm. but you don't have to consciously think about it. And your body will still keep doing this, right? Yeah. This is the vagus nerve. Uh, without it, we wouldn't be able to do these kind of things. It's a very interesting nerve. Uh, for instance, uh, only mammals have the uh, insulation around it, the mylation around the uh, vagus nerve, which is an attempt to protect it, that nerve because of the sensitivity and what it allows us to do. Uh, all the egg layers do not. And so they can't, uh, so there's a, sh a schism, even though we may be uh, vertebrates together, uh, the uh, ov ovipoid uh, species don't share the same level of emotion. So you're telling me that the blue chickens can't do this shit. Correct. <laughs> they, could, they couldn't meditate if they tried. There you is that, go. Is that, wait, so is that why they're trying to turn everybody into blue chickens? May, maybe indeed. I don't go to why. Okay, that's a why question. Okay. And I think it's probably money, but anyway. Okay. I, it, it's so interesting what you're saying about glands. A few years ago, and I, I downloaded it, and I have never had a chance to go back and read it, but I read the first few chapters. You know, when you go on Kindle, you can like read a few chapters before you decide yeah. if you want to download it. This book was basically about glands and how like actually learning to control our endocrine system and our glandular system is actually how we, uh, quote unquote, for lack of a better term, escape the system or escape the matrix or make ourselves not able to be manipulated by the system. And also what mm -hmm. you're talking about, about the pancreas, I find it really interesting that like you have these people like Steve Jobs and Bill Hicks who died of pancreatic cancer. Right when both of these people were actually making comments or adjusting our relationship to time through what they were doing, right? Yeah. And, and, and then they seem to be basically hit with some kind of weaponized pancreatic cancer or something. At least in my the way I kind of view things, whether it be you know nefarious or just something about how this system works or whatever. I don't know. Well, it could just be a side effect of the system itself because yes, yes, there's yes, such yes, a yeah. huge variation of uh, human uh, phenotypes. Yeah. That if they their soup, the the master's soup, the controller's yeah. soup is evenly spread, mm -hmm. but we're going to react to it differently yeah. based on our own genetics, right? And yeah. then there's also the epigenetic response. So uh, yeah. our genes are not stable. Yeah. We're our DNA is extremely unstable, 
and right. it can change at a moment's notice. And people don't understand the idea like of Bruce, epigenetics. Bruce Lipton, Bruce Lipton's the kind of stuff, right? Right. Yeah. Well, here's and here's a really good thing. Uh, you know, you you're in summer and all the leaves are are green and flush and everything. Fall comes and all the the leaves turn and they turn in a particular way, and that's an epigenetic response. That's the plant responding to its environment, triggering certain genes to go off and it loses all of its its leaves. And it does it first by sucking back all of the nutrients out of the leaves mm -hmm. and then discarding them. Okay. And so we, we epigenetics actually can cause major visible changes in all of us should we be able to adjust those. Now, curious thing about Steve Jobs, of course, was that he spent a great deal of his early years as a Zen crazy, mm -hmm. uh, meditating in Portland at these, uh, you know, in 24 hour marathons and stuff, right? Mm -hmm. And got a little got a little whacked out. Uh, but one of the things you do in meditation is you attempt to connect to the consciousness. The consciousness is seated in the body in the pancreas, mm -hmm. and the pancreas is next to the adrenals and and the liver, and is intimately connected with our ability to deal with time. and And it's the liver that and the uh, that part of the system that first deals with the intrusion of sugar. It's one of the mm -hmm. first additions that changes the liver's constituency. And, and sugar changes our personal relationship with time. Yeah, we, I, I we know this. Any, any, any parent that has a two or a three-year-old that sucks down on a Mountain Dew knows that sugar changes that kid's relationship with time. <laughs> you know, it's just yeah. moving like yeah, that, right? Yeah. And, and that is being driven at a temporal level. And so, see, time in this sense is, is a little bit more inclusive in my thinking than most people might allow, right? But all of these things are, are intimately connected all the way around. In fact, they're entangled. And so, so now we come back to the entanglement part of this. And not only are they attempting to entangle our brains by having us all use the time that they provide, but they're actually attempting to alter our brains by the um, taking advantage of us as humans and the way in which we react to the device that they've got that is our hookup to the net. And so, uh, because it's actually in training our minds in a particular way, it's entangle, it's entangling our consciousness in their time control level. Now, a couple of things occur to this. Um, it's possible. I'm not saying that this is feasible. I'm not saying that that this is um, a postulate I'm making, but it is possible that that there is there's temporal mechanics going on. Yeah. That there are people that are manipulating time at a level that we're not even talking about here, but at a generalized time kind of a concept. Let's just say CERN. Right. For an example, right? And CERN's attempting to manipulate time. Well, CERN may be a consciousness device. It may be attempting to hook up to all of our bazillions of pancreases yeah. being driven at a very specific frequency by our sync up into this atomic time and uh, this hypnosis that's going on to well, keep our that, consciousness that would, synced in. Synced that in. would make sense because every, you, you get sometimes, you know, when you follow the alternative media like we all do here, you get reports of people saying things like, I felt awfully strange today. Oh, look, they turned CERN up today. Correct. Yeah. Correct. So and, if, you're, and, if it changes the way your body is processing sugar, uh, if it's, we're dealing with the pancreas and CERN is connected to consciousness and our pancreas is, and it's also being affected by the amount of sugar we're eating and then what's being done with possibly with that sugar from the frequency soup acting as time crystals, it would make that part of the body, which is attached to our consciousness, definitely be affected by that. I mean, it makes perfect sense. Yeah. And also, by the way, that provides our... Um, uh, response, okay, because once we know that, we can say, oh, look, they're attempting to manipulate me through my body by uh, making me um, feel this way and driving me with these particular chemicals. Yeah. And the chemicals are in, you know, coffee, tea, etc., and it's it got sugar in it and so on. Well, you can do things like you can drink uh, non-caffeinated teas. You can take Tulsi tea, which is known as holy basil. Yeah. And holy, holy basil, the kind of plant it is, is actually a, a, HEPI, a HEPA protective, a liver protective substance. And it goes to the pancreas and it has also been shown to be um, a, a, an adrenal uh, complex, all of the adrenal glands and their connections in back into the pancreas because those connections themselves actually are, are meaningful. But so Tulsi has actually been shown to affect those in a very positive way. Yeah. Uh, and here's one of the sick parts of this that we won't go into right too far if one thought that we were food for a particular kind of a being mm -hmm. okay and part of that food was an emotional um 
Oh, shit. Uh, Here we go. State. <laughs> uh, okay, if that food was an emotional state that could be, uh, yeah. if you will, translated into some mm -hmm. form of matter, it might be adrenochrome. All right. Okay, and you yeah. perform, you produce more of that, the more stressed out and... Yeah and uh, flattened it's that the fear, the fear creates are. the loose, because the fear creates the loose, that is the meal. Correct, also, correct. Thing about the tea, there's other kinds of teas, some that I drink a lot of, like red clover tea, powdered sure. arco tea, that are sure. really good for ridding the body of yeast, fungus, and parasites, which those things all feed off of sugar. So I, I've surmised that those things, particularly, par I mean, I, I, yeast and fungus, I think, are part of a certain kind of uh, internet or communication system in the body. And when it overgrows, our body becomes too yeah. reactive to some of this stuff. And parasites in the body, they love to eat sugar, right? So they're eating this sort of altered or programmed matter, like you know, it's creating some problems in our body. I've surmised that some of these parasites are almost like the receptors for this consciousness that wants the food that is being created, right? The, the parasites in the body, are Could the parasites on, in the inside are related to the parasitic consciousness on the outside that wants to eat the meal, that would be the food that you're talking about being created. Correct. And 20 years ago or 50 years ago, no doctor would uh, believe you when you were to tell him that the bacteria in my gut are uh, intricately and intimately involved in whether or not I get depressed. And yep. they'll say, oh, it's not possible, you know, that sort of yeah. thing. So just because we can't see the giant vagus nerve that connects those, uh, you know, outside of our bodies, such a thing could indeed exist. And, because and, our, and they still won't acknowledge the connection. Well, uh, you, we learn this. A lot of what we learn, we learn empirically. What I learned was when I started to, what you learned yourself, Emily, and many other people was when I changed my diet, my depression and a lot of my emotional and mood things started to become more manageable. Well, and just to what Cliff was also saying about, about the doctors would not acknowledge that the gut bacteria is related to depression, they still won't acknowledge the connection of yeast and fungus overgrowth to almost every disease, period. Right, right. Yeah. And we're getting new paradigms on this all the time, which is really yeah. cool. The, you know, the, the um, uh, health industries are being taken out of the hands of doctors mm -hmm. and are being a lot more... Um, uh, responsible and we're actually finding new products coming on out you know c60 for taking the the toxins out of you all of these different kinds of things and people are doing it regardless of whether the the powers that be have sanctioned it through the ama right and it's working and we're becoming more healthy and we have these ways to respond so we do have ways to respond to the 5g assault okay yeah the 5g assault the, that's a whole nother thing we need to talk about that and what we can do at a at a broader level, but okay, so getting back to the idea of entanglement, all right, and time. Okay, so, um, uh, all right, so there's this Russian guy, Kozirev, who did a lot of thinking about time, he was really sharp, he wrote a lot of it down, and he had this concept that uh, time uh, cannot be uh, examined without also examining consciousness, mm -hmm. all right? And so Cozy Rev has basically got consciousness down here, and then he's got a layer of time up above it, and then a layer of space up above it, and then our minds above that. And, and that's kind of how the whole flow of the, the, the process works relative to time. Now, part of this goes right to the heart of quantum computing. All right? And it also brings up the issue of the Mandela effect mm -hmm. and what I was saying about hormesis. Uh, the process of getting stronger through little tiny doses and how we react, we over, you know, uh, we adapt and we overcome. All right. Uh, so uh, let's postulate. Well, no, let's state that uh, the construction of quantum computers is an interesting process in which they are attempting to deliberately exclude as much of consciousness as is possible. And so let's describe briefly a quantum computer, right? You take these um, chips that look like sort of like any other kind of computer chip, and you put them in a in a stainless steel tube that is sealed and vacuumed out. This stainless steel tube has no holes in it. It's a it's like a stainless steel thermos. It's a little tiny thing, and it holds these chips. This is held by this special arrangement of gimbals and dampening devices that take out all the little shutters in the room, everything. And it holds at the thickest part of the stainless steel tube. So it's not in any way, or it's trying to remove its intrusions potentially on the chips that are balanced inside this vacuumed out tube, right? We, we, as programmers, we don't 
um, we don't talk to those chips the way we talk to other chips. As programmers, we would write code on a digital machine, and this is an analog process, by the way. This chip is an analog chip, and it's inside this totally sealed off tube. There's no wires going to it. And we talk to it through microwaves. These microwave uh, receptors are around that tube the same way that if you were to sort of look at it and extrapolate, it's like the little uh, felted keys on a piano, okay? And so there's all these little things that are around the tube that put microwaves in there. This is how we tell the chip, this basically, we don't tell the chip anything. We, we, this is how we sample the state of the, of the qubit when uh, the process is completed. And then this whole arrangement of all of these little tubes that guide the microwaves down and keep them separated and are waveguides for the microwaves, all of those kind of things are all held in their own little suspension chambers, such that what starts off as a little tube, probably not you know, more than say a, a maximally eight or 10 inches tall and a couple of inches around <clears throat> in diameter. Uh, this goes up to a device that ends up being massive. And all of that mass, all of that effort, so they're not trying to create a laptop out of this thing, right? They're not trying to get these, reduce these qubits down to the point where they can put them in your phone. Such will not happen as far as we can understand it, the process at this point. And they don't care about the mass. In fact, the mass works to their advantage because their goal is to reduce all intrusions of all kinds of radiation, including consciousness. Mm. <clears throat> and when you program for quantum computers, you write a program that at some point goes to a little um, subroutine that samples that chip and brings back the results. And it, at that point, you have to acknowledge that whatever was on that chip, you have to capture in a digital fashion because it's no longer on that chip the instant you look at it. So looking at the state of the, of the qubits causes the data, the, what they call the superposition or the transposition, to be firmly seen and that destroys the data. This is, so we're talking really spooky woo-woo uh, quantum kind of stuff, right? And you take an image of that and then you solve your problem with whatever it is you were asking, you know, the, to do So the what is the instruction set that you're sending to it? What are we tasking with a quantum computer that's different than working in binary? And what is the work product that's resulting from such an interaction because now we have three layers. We have the human programming through an instruction set that clearly needs to be language neutral from the standpoint of any emotional response or anything. Right. Right. And it's, and it's, and it's a, it looks very much like Python or, okay. or I think they call it F sharp. That's what they're calling it Q sharp. Or Q sharp, sorry. It's yeah, yeah. It's like, it's like yeah. F sharp. Yeah, it's like yes, F sharp, which, like which, which was with the abstraction. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, uh, okay, so there's a concept of a virtual machine that gets mm -hmm. you right up to the connection of the, uh, to where you are relative to the qubits. And so you might write a program, if you were Google, you would write a program that would say, uh, show me the um, uh, row in our huge index that has the, um, a uh, car company with the cheapest used Chevrolets on the lot. You know, a, a weird kind of a search, right? But you've got so many uh, car lots in your index and so many cars and all of this, your, your computer chips, regular binary chips going through brute force would take about seven years to compute that, right? Cross comparing and everything. But because of uh, transposition or superposition, that uh, qubits array is thought to contain the accurate information uh, because it can uh, basically, because it's not just a zero or a one, <clears throat> it's not either or, <clears throat> it's always both and. Both and, okay, yeah. Up until you look at it, and then that freezes the state, all right? And so this is the, this is the hidden fallacy of quantum computing. It's only about 80% accurate, all right? So yeah. only eight out of 10 times when you snap a picture off the qubits, do you actually get the row you're trying to find? Or then how do you even know it's the correct answer? Is that a st is that you a st find out? Okay, so it's so a they've statistical done tests. abstraction. No, no, they've actually been able to do tests. Okay, okay, so sense. we yeah. know this. Okay. Correct through through an empirical uh, experiment where they said we've got you know a, a billion rows. We know it'll take us uh, you know, um, 16 and a half days to come up with the answer through our regular computers. We set our servers to go. We let them run the 16 and a half days. It looks out, comes out a little bit longer than that, but it comes out with a particular row. 
And indeed, that is our answer. When we go and look at that row in our database, do the calculations on it that we were looking at, that's the row we want. And then we can do the computer, uh, do the same uh, query with the uh, qubits. And instead of the 16 and a half days, it takes you maybe a day to write the program or whatever. When you fire it off, it takes, you know, milliseconds to compute and, and you bring it back and there you go. Eight out of 10 times, it will come back when you ask it that, that run that program, eight out of 10 times, it comes back with the row you've already previously established is the correct result. But two out of the 10 times, it does not. Now, and their, their thinking is, and this is an aside, we, this really wasn't the point of this at all, but their thinking is that it's, that's a consciousness leak. Mm. Okay, so that at some point- So what if you were, so okay. what if you were to parallel process using 10 of those units and run a mathematical- There's, no? there's the rub, dude. This, uh, each individual quantum computer is the most massively parallel machine you've ever imagined. Okay. okay? Because, right. okay, because here you have one chip, uh, one qubit, and it can be on, off, or both, all right? But then if we have 50 of these things in a row, or 100 of these qubits in that can, then you've got an array that is 100 by 100 that uh, can be times three. So it's a three-dimensional array at that point. And so, you, and so you're basically sampling all the rows at once and freezing it. And when you sample it, you destroy the data, you, and then you freeze it and you have your answer, see? And so it's more massively parallel than, and, you, and so doubling up with the qubits on other machines is not necessarily becoming more parallel. In fact, it might actually degrade your results because they've, I'm just gonna bring up, they've had issues of, the, of this, okay? So the early tests in the quantum computers, they had higher failure rates. At times the failure rates would scale up. They wouldn't know what was going on and they would try all different kinds of things. And they basically came to the conclusion that it was consciousness that was intruding. And if you had too much consciousness intrude, the qubits did not How do you work. quantify qu consciousness intrusion? Uh, how I, you're saying this has to be perfectly isolated because my concept of consciousness is consciousness is it is completely woven into the fabric of our reality. I don't even know how you escape consciousness because yeah. you Can there's I, only only consciousness. It, there our, is our only, reality. Yeah, is extracted from it. The, okay. See, this is where the theoretical aspects of it, and I've looked at it, and I admit it. It is challenging to conceptualize, probably more based on the model that I have of of what how it works than anything. But at the same time, when you're talking about isolating from consciousness, to me that sounds impossible. It is okay, but it, but it's practically doable. Okay, so okay, so you don't have to get you don't have to get 100 percent gone. Perfect, you only need yeah, to get 80 percent okay. gone or 90 percent, okay. right? So here's my question. I'm going to do the best I can to ask this in a way that makes sense because I'm not a techie, computery person. Is this go to this idea? So you're talking about consciousness leaks. Does this go possibly to the intent of the person doing the search? They're looking for an answer that they want. Right. And so their intent is when, when is it the strength of the intent of the person looking for a particular answer. Could that be part of the consciousness leak? Is this part of like uh, the idea of uh, the humor, the humans creation, creating reality, right? They're magnificent yep. human yep. creator. And if the intent of kind of like a person with the proper, who understood how to do this, how to use their intent to will things into existence could almost make something up and it would come true anyway. Correct. Okay. okay. And they, and they go to great lengths to remove that. And, now, and so they're trying to turn this into a non, a non-human creative kind of place by isolating out consciousness so we can no longer create the reality that we want and they can create sort of this consciousness isolated prison. Correct. Okay. okay. Now, uh, now what they're doing, we're just focusing on the, on the qubit yeah. right here. Okay. They well, want that consciousness. Way, um... Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they, they want that. Yeah. Extremely well. So they, they want to isolate the consciousness and they want to do it around that stainless steel container with those qubits in it. Okay. And they, so that's as far as it's so funny. The, the jail is really small. We're all out here, but they're using this little thing instead of jailing right. it in there. Oh, it's like a reverse, uh, like, it's like, uh, like using it in the reverse. Everything's an inversion. I totally Correct. get it. Yeah. Okay. So, so if you want to think about it that way, these guys are inside or they're doing everything they can to push consciousness out of a particular space 
Right. They're okay. trying to keep reality this small and unaffected by consciousness instead of having this broad canvas that we can in, uh, uh, affect. And, our and we energy. know, we know that those qubits don't exist without consciousness. Everything right. is conscious at some level. It's all yeah. part of consciousness, et cetera. So they've got a real task ahead of them. Okay. <laughs> all right. So, so what, here's what they do. As I was saying, they've got all these gimbals and we're talking fine. This is swish. fucking Schrodinger's cat on steroids. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And it gets even, it gets even more interesting because mm. they, they have, you know, uh, Swiss engineers, you know, and, and craftsmen working on these gimbals. They're doing everything they can to isolate all vibration. But Why it, is that? Because everything in universe that's affected by consciousness spins, which of course is a form of vibration frequency. This is almost an impossible. While it's a possible task, it's almost impossible because as long as you have humans so, who by nature have consciousness and want to create, even if they've done everything they can to suppress that, are working on this. So the only way they're actually going to maybe ever get to be, this to happen is by many generations down the road of robots whose consciousness. Is this thing? So yes. They may not care that much, though. See, anyway. okay, yeah. So, so is this thing actually capable of escape velocity of the twenty-two trillion per second no. creation? No. No. Okay. No. All right. No. And I'm, I'm going to take out my headphones here and, and take my shirt off, but I'll keep talking. <laughs> uh, but uh, no, it's not. It's not capable of getting <laughs> us down to the twenty-two so trillion level of anything. Getting naked. Right? <laughs> Oh, no.